Perhaps the most misunderstood aspect of selling is a subject that a lot of people refer to as closing the sale. To begin with, I'd like to clarify a couple of things. Number one, the close itself is actually a part of the sales process. It's not a separate entity. It's part of the process. And yet over and over, as we go around the country, I hear salesmen all over come up to me and say, well, you know, I'm pretty good at prospecting or I'm pretty good at presentation. I do all of the things that are necessary, but when it comes down to closing, somehow or another, I tighten up. Well, let me hasten to add that in my opinion, no normal man or woman who truly likes people is what you would classify as a closer in the closer's definition. Most people think of a closer, in other words, when you start talking about closer's definitions as a guy that when he gets you under the gun, he just sits on you and says, bye, bye, bye. In my judgment, this is not what a closer really is all about. Now, I can't reach up and grab just one word or two words or a sentence or a phrase or even a paragraph and say that this is what a closer is. But I can tell you this, that closing is not a natural process any more than smoking a cigarette is a natural process. You remember, you guys who smoke, do you remember when you first smoked the first cigarette, how the body said, no, 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 I don't like it, I don't like it. And you, in effect, said, yes, you do, you're going to like it, you're going to like it, I'm going to jam it down your throat, you got to like it. And so the body, in effect, says, all right, all right, I'll do it, but I'm not going to like it, I'll tell you that right now. And then a little bit later on, the body said, well, okay, you know, really, it's not as bad as I had thought it would be. And then a little later on, the body says, hey, this is not bad at all. Matter of fact, I kind of like it. And then a little bit later on, the body says, hey, not only do I like it, but I've got to have it. I've got to have it. Now, folks, when we start talking about closing the sale, I want to be able to present something to you and sell you on an idea, and I believe we'll be able to do so. Let's look at closing. Why do most people have difficulty with it? And I say most because I'm persuaded that initially most people do have trouble with closing. I believe basically that it's a psychological problem. I've seen guys weigh 240 pounds selling merchandise to a 105 pound housewife. And they would talk and talk and talk. They'd beat around the bush nine different ways, hoping that this little 105 pound housewife would finally say, I'll take it. And then you see the salesman wouldn't have to ask for the order. You see, there's an inherent danger in asking for an order. Suppose the prospect says no, then where are you going to go? And this is kind of interesting. You see, most salesmen fear a no. And let me explain to you why they fear the no. They don't really understand what the no means. They do not understand the difference between refusal and rejection. You see, we get so wrapped up in our product. We get so enthused about what we're doing, and any salesman worth his salt, any good salesman that I have ever seen in my life, gets wrapped up in what he's doing. He believes so fervently in his product or his goods or his services that it's beyond his comprehension to understand why the prospect wouldn't buy. And then all of a sudden it dawns on the salesman, I know why that bird's not buying from me. He doesn't believe my story because if he believed my story, there's no way in the world he could say no. And then the salesman's mental process says, that guy is calling me a liar. Where does he get off calling me a liar? This is part of the process that he goes through. Let's go to our children to learn a little something about closing a sale. You see, a child understands instinctively the difference between refusal and rejection. There's an enormous difference. You see, when the customer says no, a child would know that they simply mean no. But the salesman fears rejection. He interprets it as being that. We have a little four-year-old boy. We had three daughters, and then 10 years later, we got the little boy, so we call him Mac for middle-aged carelessness. <laughs> <laughs> this little boy, you see, <laughs> he understands a lot of things. He's a great sales trainer. Now, for instance, if he asks for something and I say no, he simply, in his mind, he figures that I just blew it. I just missed, that's all. But he doesn't hold it against me. Two minutes later, he gives me a brand new chance. 
<laughs> and if I miss again, two minutes later, he doesn't hold it against me. He gives me a brand new chance. How many of you have got kids that are just that good to you? <laughs> I think everybody has. You see, the child understands the difference between refusal and rejection. He knows totally and completely that he's loved. There's no thought of rejection there. He just figures mom or dad simply blew it. They missed the question. You know, if you think about it for a moment, if we can adopt the same attitude, we are not being rejected, we simply are being refused. You see, what the customer is really saying is based on the information you have given me up until this point, the answer is no. You must understand in the sales process that always the price starts out considerably higher than value. And so you start giving value and along the way you ask for the order. But at that stage of the game, the value is not as high as the price, so the answer's got to be no. It's got to be no. Then you build value a little higher and perhaps you ask again, but value still is not as high as price. And so again, the answer has got to be no, so you build value again and the instant that value and price equals, that's the point that the customer buys. But that's not necessarily the point that the customer gives you the order. There's a vast difference. You see, there's still that decision-making process involving action that's got to enter the picture. So many people hate to make decisions. They hate them. So what we need to do in our process is understand something about decision-making in the process. You see, logic makes people think, but it's emotion that makes people act. Now, the problem with all emotion is that if you sell tonight or today, then tomorrow when the customer gets logical on you, they might well say, hey, I wish I hadn't bought. And the problem with all logic is that you can persuade them maybe logically that you've got a good deal, but logic doesn't really make most people act. And so we've got to combine the two. So first of all, let's understand the difference between refusal and rejection. And second, let's see if we can overcome a psychological hang-up that we've had since childhood when it comes to closing sales. You remember as a child when your parents would say, now, Tom, don't ask for everything you see. Don't ask, ask, ask. That's all you do is you ask for this, you ask for that, and you ask for the other. It's ask, ask, ask. Don't ask for everything you see. It's not nice. How many of you ever had your parents tell you this? I think every man, woman, and child in the world has had this told to them over and over. Don't ask for everything in sight. And then one day you get in selling, and the sales manager says, Mel, you got to ask for the order. Ask for the order. Ask for the order. Everybody says, ask for the order. But you see, you got a conflict. You've got a conflict. And this conflict, you see, is what makes a lot of guys not ask for orders. As a matter of fact, when it comes to closing sales, this is where the colorful salesman comes to light. And by colorful, of course, I mean yellow. <laughs> you know, when you get right down to it, <laughs> this is the thing that so many people never quite really grasp is this little illustration I hope will make it clear. Let's suppose that you were going from Dallas to Fort Worth one night in your car, driving along, thinking beautiful, positive thoughts, minding your own business, driving within the law because you're a good citizen. And all of a sudden, over on the right-hand side of the freeway, you see a glitter. And so you say, hey, I wonder what that is. Curiosity gets the better of you. So you pull over to the side and you stop. And you discover, oh boy, oh boy, it's a gold brick. And man, you grab that gold brick and you make a mad dash for the car, looking around to make certain that nobody sees you. And then you look back where you got the one gold brick and you make an amazing discovery. There are two more gold bricks where the one was. So you very quickly deposit the first one in your car and go grab the two and run back to the car. And then all of a sudden you remember something. This is public domain. Hey, I don't have to be sneaky about this. I can just haul it away. It's mine. You're delighted uh, with this realization because in place of two, now there are four more gold bricks. So you get the four, and then there are eight. You get the eight, and then there are 16. You get the 16, and there are 32. You load your car, but there's still an enormous amount of gold left. So what you do is you stop the first car coming down the highway and say, hey, why don't you haul away some gold, don't we? <laughs> oh, oh, you don't? <laughs> That's right, you sure don't. 
I'll tell you what you do. You call the best friends you've got or the closest friend or close relative. And this is the way the conversation goes. You call them and you say, well, Larry, I know it's 10 o'clock at night and you probably have already gotten dressed for bed and are watching your favorite television program. And I hate to bother you about this because I'm not sure you'd be interested anyhow. But Larry, out here on the expressway, and I'm nearly 20 miles from where you live, I just found a gold mine. I don't, like I said, I don't think you'd be interested in it, but in case you were, if you wanted to come over in your car and, and load up, it'd be all right. The, the only thing is you'd, you know, you would have to, to give me a 20% finder's fee. And I, and I, well, listen, I'm sorry I bothered Jack Larry, because I know you wouldn't be interested in such as that. Now, that's the way you'd call him, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Did you realize that this is about the most ridiculous thing in the world? And yet, when an average salesman, if he is a recruiter, for instance, if he's given somebody an opportunity, or if he's got a product or a service that he's selling, first of all, if it's not worth more than he's asking for it, he's not an honest man in selling it. And this I'd like to make crystal clear. The man who thoroughly believes in what he's got has actually some missionary zeal. He's got some crusader spirit in him. He wants to share. I'll tell you how that telephone call would go. You would be so excited, you would be probably a little incoherent. You'd get on the telephone and you'd say, Larry, man alive, I'm out here on the expressway between Dallas and Fort Worth, and I have just seen the most amazing thing you have ever seen in your life. Larry, it's a gold mine. It's out here. It's right there, Larry. I want you to get in your car. I want you to come over here right now, Larry, and load up. Now, I'm going to charge you 20% finance fee, but Larry, this thing absolutely will make you the richest man in town. It's fantastic. You would be so excited and so enthused. That's the way you'd be about it. Why? because you're not thinking about the 20% that you would get out of it. You're thinking about the enormous value that your customer or your prospect would get. Now, once you are able in your own mind to establish as a basic fact that what you've got is going to benefit the customer more than the sale is going to benefit you at that instant, you can become a much more effective closer. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have got every dime you've ever made in the field of selling? Could I see your hand? Not one single human being ever has, all right? How many of you have customers who are still using and enjoying benefits from products you sold to them years ago? All right, would you then say that your customer is better off as a result of the sale than you were as a result of making it? All right. In other words, then, what you've done is you've helped somebody, haven't you? Do you know what the Norwegian definition of the word sell is? Selje is the Norwegian word for sell. It means to serve. It's a beautiful definition, isn't it? All right. Then what I'm really saying is that if you have a good product or a good service and you're not closing, you, my friends, are refusing to serve. <coughs> You see, one of the most beautiful philosophies in life I've ever heard is simply this one because it's so true. You can get everything in life that you want if you help enough other people get what they want. And you see, the only way you can benefit is by the close. Now, I have what I call emotional keys in selling or in closing. There are 11 of them. Let's look at these emotional keys, and as we discuss them, let me make it crystal clear that each particular key doesn't apply to every situation, nor does it apply in every business. But there is so much here that I don't care whether you're selling brushes door to door, or selling mutual funds, or selling stock, or automobiles, or vapor injectors. It makes no difference what you're selling. There's so much of this that's so applicable. Let's look at the first key. It's called the key of positive projection. To me, this is the beginning point for everything. You will close more sales, you'll get more business in your own home or in your own office than you will anywhere else. You see, you've got to start in your own home, in your own office, with your own thinking. You've got to get projected into your own mind exactly what you want to happen out in the field before you go out in the field. Some of you might have seen where Gary Player won the United States Open at the age of 12. He was the youngest man ever to win a major golf tournament, age 12. And yet this is one of the most coveted titles in golf. 
Now, I'll have to admit that it was about 15 years later before he donned the coat and collected the trophy and the money. But I insist he won this trophy, he won this tournament at the age of 12. Because you see, when Gary Player was on the golf putting greens in Johannesburg, South Africa, at age 12, he would line up that putt and he'd say, I'm going to knock this 14-footer in for the U.S. Open. When he'd step up to the tee to hit his drive, he'd say, I'm going to split the fairway to win the U.S. Open. If he ever got in a sand trap as he was blasting out, he'd say, I'm going to blast in the cup for the U.S. Open. This guy projected in his mind for years what he wanted to happen. You see, the way the human mind works, it goes to work immediately on completing whatever picture you plant in the mind. The unfortunate thing, ladies and gentlemen, is the fact that most people plant into their minds what they do not wish to happen. You need to be positive about the results you're going to get. You see, the depression, if there ever is one, is not going to be out there in the business world. The depression will exist between the ears. This is where the salesman has his problem. So the first key is the key of positive projection. The second key is the key of listen. Most salesmen don't. How many of you are familiar with Dale Carnegie's book, How to Make Friends and Influential People? Can I see your hand? Okay, that's great. Most of you are. Of course, you know, he never wrote such a book, did he? Now, he did write a book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, but not How to Make Friends and Influential People, did he? <laughs> what I'm saying really is that you see when I said Dale Carnegie you said why certainly in your own mind that's the first thing you said and then when I said how to you said of course and in your own mind your hand goes way up you see you didn't really listen to the finish of it most salespeople don't the customer will start to tell them something and the, the salesman either listens too fast and finishes it for them or they don't listen at all it's kind of like the lady whose husband died so she moved in with her brother-in-law. She'd been there about two months, and finally one morning she got up and walked in his room, walked straight up to him and said, John, I want you to take my dress off. Well, this shocked old John. I mean, it really did. But he did. Then she said, now I want you to take my slip off. Well, this just flabbergasted. But he did. Then she said, now, if I ever catch you wearing them again, I'm going to call the police. <laughs> <laughs> A rather interesting fact is, I think, pretty obvious. Everybody here, everybody here was listening cons considerably faster than I was talking. You see, this is a mistake we make with customers. Now, some of our customers might be kind of like when you cross a tiger with a parrot. You know, I mean, they might not look like much, but friend, when they talk, you ought to listen. <laughs> The interesting thing here is that most salespeople don't know how to listen. They really don't. They get so wrapped up in their own story, their own presentation, if you will, that they forget the purpose of the call. The purpose of that call is to sell merchandise. That's a rather interesting thing is the fact that most salesmen think the only way to listen is with your ears, and it's not. We have what we call the shelf method of listening. That's spelled C-H-E-L. The C stands for chin or cheek. You watch your customer. If he or she starts stroking their chin very slowly and very softly or starts stroking their cheek, this is a signal of satisfaction and gratification. They are buying what you're selling. H stands for hands. You watch your customer's hands. If he begins to rub his hands, particularly palm against palm, this is an indication of ownership. In his own mind, he is already the owner of whatever it is that you're selling. E stands for eyes. Now, in this particular case, if the prospect has some birthdays, it's quite helpful. You look around the eyes, and if these crow's feet begin to relax, this says to you, this prospect is buying. F stands for friendly. When your prospect says, Mel, you old son of a gun. You know, Jesse James used a gun. <laughs> and here you are using a pencil to get my money. Well, he's buying. If he reaches over and picks up either your order book or whatever it is that you're demonstrating, he's buying. He's getting friendly with you. Now, let me give you an illustration about when not to listen. Though I think this is important. In 1955, I hired a little lady out of a department store in Great Falls, South Carolina. Her name is Merle Hoke. Merle Hoke has one of the most unique hearing situations that I think I've ever seen. 
You can be three feet from her and speak in a very loud tone directly into her face saying, No, Merle, I do not want it. And her eyelashes won't even blink. There'll be no way of knowing that she has heard you say anything. But if you whisper yes at 60 paces, <laughs> I guarantee you, Merle Hope will hear it every time. You see, she quite early learned something very significant in selling, and that is that when the prospect says no, they don't really mean it. It's only when they say yes that they're serious. <laughs> <laughs> and so Merle, Merle listens for the yes. Let me tell you something else unusual about this great sales lady. She understands something that's so very basic. The salesman is an assistant buyer. That's all. I've never heard Merle say, I sold somebody anything. What Merle says is, I either let them have it or I help them get it. <laughs> There's quite a difference. You see, this really is an important point in selling. The key of listening is a vital key. The next key, the key of the assumptive attitude. Here's one thing that you young fellows who are still single will appreciate. You see, selling and courting run absolutely parallel paths. There is no difference. They're literally is no difference. Now, how many of you guys, for instance, when you were single and courting, ever said to the girl, is it all right if I hold your hand? Do you mind if I put my arm around you? Could I kiss you? Is that the way you do? How many of you ever kissed a girl? Could I see your hand? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this means, this means then that you kissed her without permission, doesn't it? Uh-uh. As a matter of fact, you probably had permission 30 minutes before you took advantage of it. <laughs> <laughs> and yet I think I can safely say that the little girl didn't pop right and say, okay, partner, now plant it there. <laughs> Any more than the customer says, hey, Tom, that's what I've been looking for. Gee, I was hoping some salesman would come by with that particular product. Go ahead and write the order, and I'll go get my checkbook and give it to you. How many of you guys could pay the light bill if that's the only way you made a sale? Could I see your hands? Okay. Now, what I'm really saying is this, that with the exception of a man who runs a restaurant where they come in and order, this almost never happens, does it? The customer doesn't come out in most cases and say, okay, I'll take it. Any more than the girl says, okay, partner, plant it there. But they let you know in 101 different ways with a flip of the wrist a shrug of the shoulders, a turn of the head, a smile on the face, the gleam in the eye, or whatever. The customer, by asking questions, or making uh, a simple movement sometimes, simply is telling you, yes, I'm ready to buy. And what you do is the same as you did when you were courting. You assumed it was all right to hold a little girl's hand, and so you reached out and grabbed it. And if it was not all right, she let you know. And it's seldom fatal. <laughs> And as a matter of fact, if you tried it a little too soon, she might have said no, but then five minutes later, it might have been perfectly all right. And it's the same in selling. The little girl didn't say, put your arm around me. And as a matter of fact, the first time you tried it, she might have brushed you off. But that's not fatal either in most cases. Disappointing, <laughs> but not fatal. Okay, and yet 20 minutes later, it might have been perfectly all right in the customer. You see, when you tried initially for even the appointment, they might have said no. And yet, if you gave them a reason for the appointment, assuming all the time that you were going to get it, then you begin to move toward the sale. You see, you must assume the customer is interested or the prospect is interested in what you've got. You must assume that they're going to be delighted to see it. You must assume, if you will, that they're going to listen with an open mind at the presentation. And yes, you must assume that they are going to go ahead and buy that night. Now, here's a rather interesting thing. If you were to take the little girl out and wine her and dine her all evening, and then get her to the front door, and she was, in effect, in a half puckered up position, you wouldn't say, well, sweetie, it's, it's kind of late now, and I'll tell you what I'll do, I'll come by tomorrow, you know, and give you the good night kiss. <laughs> you see, tomorrow you'd have to start all over, wouldn't you? And so when the customer, when you've wined and dined the customer, when you've courted the customer, when you've assumed all the way through that this is what they are going to do, then when it gets down to the close, that is just as natural as the goodnight kiss. It's part of the entire process. That's what I'm talking about when I talk about the assumptive attitude. The next key is 
easily the most unused key. It's the key of the subordinate question. You see, most people don't really understand this bit about asking questions. Let me give you a little personal experience that I think is kind of funny and it so perfectly illustrates what I'm talking about. Last October, I was scheduled to be in Greenville, South Carolina for some work over there. I had written in advance to the Holiday Inn for reservations. I did not hear from them, so I assumed I had the reservation. When I got over there and walked in the lobby, I knew I was in trouble because on the lobby wall was a big sign, traveling men avoid Greenville, South Carolina, the week of October 11, 15, textile week. So I knew I was in trouble, but I walked up to the desk and I said, I'm Zig Ziglar. Would you check my mail, please? I was filling out the registration. The little girl wasn't impressed. She said, do you have a reservation? I said, certainly. She said, how long have you had it? And I said, oh, long time. She said, how long? I said, about three weeks. She said, impossible. We haven't had a reservation available in over a year. This is textile week, and this is literally true. And I said, now, look, ma'am, you're not trying to tell me that I don't have a room. She said, yes, I am, too. And about that time, another girl walked out. And uh, the clerk apparently was new and somewhat relieved. When the other girl walked out, she said, oh, this is Miss Fortune. And I grinned and I said, she doesn't look like Miss Fortune to me. That looks like good news. <laughs> <laughs> she, she said, Mr. Ziegler, for some people, yes, but for you, bad news. I said, now, just one minute. I said, don't say another word. I must ask you two questions. He said, all right, ask them. I said, number one, do you consider yourself an honest woman? And she kind of grinned and said, why, of course. I said, that's great. Number two, if President Johnson were to walk through that door right there, right now, and come over here and say, I would like a room for the night, would you give it to him? She said, why, you know I would. I said, okay, you're an honest woman? I'm an honest man. You have my word. He's not going to come through that door. <laughs> I'll take his room. <laughs> I give you my word. I spent the night in the Holiday Inn that evening. <laughs> now, you see, all I did was ask some questions. That's all, just questions. One of the greatest questions, this is a subordinate question, when you get down kind of to the short rows, this is a good one. You simply look at the customer and say, well, have you got yourself sold, or should I tell you more? You see, the intriguing thing about that question is the fact that you can't miss it. You say, have you got yourself sold, or should I tell you more? You see, if he says, no, you better tell me more, then that's all any salesman, anywhere, at any time, ever ask is a chance to tell his story. If he says, no, you got me sold, or I've got myself sold, of course, <laughs> we write the order. Let me define a subordinate question. A subordinate question is any question, the answer to which, if positive, means they've bought. But if negative, it does not necessarily mean that they have not bought. Now, what I'm really saying is this is that if you can ask the proper questions, you can lead your prospect to the decision that will permit them to buy. Our function as salespeople is to find out what the other person's problem is and help them solve it. Let's look at the next key. It's called the key of the impending event. What is the key of the impending event? Well, it's a key that is used to make people aware of why they should buy now. For instance, if you're in the insurance business, you know, one impending event is another birthday, isn't it? If you're in the real estate business, one of the impending events is property values continually go up. If you're in the office machines business, one of the impending events is we know that the cost of labor and goods are going up, therefore the materials, the finished product has got to go up. Whatever your business is, there is always an impending event. You see, one of the reasons that most people, a lot of people give for not buying is that, well, this is no hurry. Well, I mean, why rush into this thing, you see? And so the impending event key is one that we can effectively use. If we can point out to this prospect how if they act now, it's going to be to their benefit. In other words, make them the hero. Be smart. Make a wise business decision. Act now. That's what impending event's all about. The next key is the key of physical action. Physical action is to get in position to sell. For instance, if you sell merchandise in homes, in my judgment, physical action is having your prospect back in the den or in the kitchen when you make your sales presentation. 
The reason for it, you see, is that company visits in the living room, friends visit in the den and in the kitchen. So physical action is getting them in the best position to sell. Physical action, if you are calling on husband and wife together, physical action is having the wife between you, the salesman, and the husband. The reason is pretty simple. Each time you, the salesman, make a point to the husband, you've got to go past the wife's eyes to make the point. In short, she's enclosed, or included rather, in all of the conversation. Now, I know the man's the head of the house, but the woman is the neck, and it is the neck that turns the head. And if that neck's going to be turning the head, we want it turning it up and down instead of round and round. So we want the wife in on the act. Physical action, in short, is getting a man in position to close. You see, you argue standing up. You debate standing up. You sell sitting down. So if it's at all feasible as you start the real closing process, you get in closing position. So it's a natural thing. It's just like courting again. See, when you get to the door, even though the girl is ready for you to kiss her goodnight, most of them still not going to grab you. You've got to initiate the physical action. It's just like in selling. Even though the prospect is going to buy, he's not going to reach out and grab your pen from your hand and your order book and say, okay, I'll write the order. This is not the way it's done, obviously. The next key is easily the most misunderstood key of them all. It's called the key of persistence. If you were to ask 100 guys on the street, what do you think of the persistent salesman? I can guarantee you that 100 of them would say, man, deliver me. I don't want to have anything to do with a persistent salesman. There are no sir, nothing. And the reason they say that is the average man on the street, and even in the sales profession itself, they regard the persistent salesman, or they think of him as the guy that says, oh, you know you're going to buy it, go ahead and sign here. Oh, you know you want it, go ahead and sign here. Oh, the only way you're going to get it is to sign it, go ahead. When you're going to get it sooner or later, go ahead and sign here. This is not persistence, this is just sheer stupidity. There's no way in the world that you can do anything but get mad at me if I pull a stunt like that. What then is persistence? Persistence is simply this. When the customer says no, it all, the only thing it means, as I said earlier, is that they're saying no to what you've told them thus far. You give them some brand new information. Then they are entitled to make another decision. If the decision is still no, you give them some brand new information, more reasons for an affirmative decision, and then you give them another opportunity to make another decision. Persistence is, to me, one of the most important keys. I'll never forget. When I was in the cookware business, we used to demonstrate for husbands and wives, you know, at these big cookouts, roast beef and potatoes and the works. How many of you have ever been to one of those demonstrations? We would uh, call for husband and wife to be together the next day when we made the call. And the reason was pretty simple. If husband and wife were together, we generally sold. If they were not together, we generally did not sell. I'll never forget this one time. I stress that particularly strong. And I said, husband and wife together tomorrow. So the next day, I made my first call. But overnight, I developed laryngitis. I got to the first home, and I knocked on the door. The lady came to the door, and she was something kind of special, you know, body by Fisher, brain by Tinker Toy. <laughs> I said, hello. I never forget, I call on this one family the next day, and I'm not saying that the old boy was overweight, but he was about five and a half inches too short. <laughs> I call on this particular family in the rural area of South Carolina, just south of the little town of Lancaster. I made the call, I made the presentation, I asked the obligating question. No boy was sitting there in overalls, and he held his hand up, his right hand, and said, Mr. Ziegler, he said, now, I know this ain't going to mean much to you. Because he said, I know you got a bathroom in your house. But he said, I won't tell you something. He said, me and my wife been married 22 years. And he said, for 22 years, I've been promising her I was going to build her a bathroom. And for 22 years, something's always happened. One year, we'd have a new baby. Another year, we'd have a lousy crop. Another year, the tractor would break down. Another year, it'd be something else. Another year, something else. And for 22 years, I've been saying, next year, we're going to build a bathroom. Well, he said, I want you to know one thing. 
He said, I got that money for that bathroom right here. And he patted his pocket, you know, at the top of the overalls. That's where the pockets are. He patted his pocket there and he said, I'll tell you right now. He said, I got that money right here to build me that bathroom. And he said, I guarantee you. And his exact words were, ain't you nor nobody else are going to get one dime of my money until I build that bathroom. Now, friends, he was persuasive. <laughs> he was a salesman. He sold me hook, line, and sinker. Maybe I was too easily sold. Maybe I had too much empathy because it hadn't been too long since I'd been making some cold, wet trips. So I could, uh, <laughs> I could sympathize with, <laughs> with his position. So I kind of grinned and I folded my briefcase and stole away like a thief in the night. You see, what I had done is I had refused to lay my ego on the line. Most salesmen are so wrapped up in having that customer like them that they forget they're there to sell something. This was my problem. I laid my ego out just a little bit, and he just bruised it slightly, and I withdrew it quickly. I've seen guys do this 10,000 times in the years I've been in sales training. They'll be talking along, you know, and the customer will say, hey, Mel, you're not trying to sell me something, are you? And the salesman says, oh, no, no. Well, what are you, a professional visitor? <laughs> <laughs> Two days later, I was on the streets of Lancaster, South Carolina, and I bumped into this man's sister. And she crossed the street, literally, to see me, and she said, I want to know what happened to you and my brother. And I said, what do you mean, what happened? Why, we're friends. She said, oh, no, you're not. You see, I thought we were friends for one simple reason. I'd been a perfect gentleman. I had not insisted that they buy. I had not registered any disappointment or anger at all. I had graciously accepted defeat and left. So I couldn't understand what she was talking about when she said, no, you're not friends. So I asked her, I said, well, what do you mean we're not friends? She said, he's so mad at you right now that I honestly believe that if he were to see you on the street today, that he'd whip you. I said, you got to be kidding. She said, no, I'm not. He's plenty mad at you. And I said, well, why is he mad at me? And she said, well, I'll tell you why he's mad at you. She said, he wanted to buy a set of them pots, and you wouldn't even sell them to him. And I said, well, I'll take care of that right now. I'm on my way back out there. She said, you better not. She said, I'm not kidding. You wouldn't get in the house. I don't believe he would buy anything from you if you were the last man alive. Well, I was dumbfounded. What had I done? How could he be mad at me? Well, you know, I thought about that for a long time. And I don't know how I happened to come up with the answer, but it was a lot of months later. I was walking down the street somewhere, I've even forgotten where, and all of a sudden it dawned on me. And it was just as clear why this man was mad at me, and rightly so, as anything that has ever occurred to me. It was, it was just like stepping from a dark room into a brilliantly lighted room. It was crystal clear. Here's why he's mad at me. At the demonstration, I had said that this set of cookware would save at least $100 a year, and that's what it cost. Now, if it saves $100 a year and costs $100, there's no way in the world that any man with the money in his pocket could say, I can't afford it. You see, if it'll save that kind of money, it'll pay for itself. If it will pay for itself, it doesn't cost anything. And if it doesn't cost anything, how can you not afford it? That's the first thing I'd said. It'll pay for itself. I'd also said it would be better for your family because it'll save more of the food value. I had further said that it would save your wife a lot of work. That's what I'd said. Obviously, in that man's mind, I had lied to him. It would not do all of those things. Otherwise, I would have insisted that he buy. And so he didn't want to do business with a liar. I don't blame him. I don't either, and neither do you. So that was it. He didn't want to do business with a liar. Or else it was even worse than that. It would save that $100 a year. It would save the value of the food and be better for his family. It would save his wife's work. But I wasn't interested in that. All I was interested in was a fast deal and a quick buck. And when I saw I wasn't going to get that, I said in my own mind, to heck with you, friend, I'll go somewhere else. You see, I had no interest in him or his family as a fellow human being. And he didn't want to have anything to do with me. And friends, he was right all the way. You know what persistence is? Persistence is not a thing in this world, but an indication of your belief in what you've got.
If you believe, you will persist. If you do not believe, you will not persist. Now, there's a vast difference in the way that we persist. We must learn the skill of persisting, just, if you will, back to courting. How many of you guys were as at ease the first date you ever had with a girl as you were on the tenth date? As you gain a little more confidence and as you get to know your prospects better, as you get to know your products better, as you get more proficient and efficient in your field, these things come to you. And so this bit of persistence, each time a prospect says no, what they're really saying is, give me enough justification to make a favorable decision. Tell me more. Give me more information. That's all this man was saying. Tell me why I should buy now. The next key is the key of inducement. What is the key of inducement? It's, well, my friend Bill Gold puts this one so beautifully. When Bill says value added is an inducement, you see, we have a saying in sales business, when your products are almost equal, your salesman better not be. What is this thing that we call value added that Bill Gold refers to? That's the you that goes in every sale. You see, with every sale, you can tell your prospect, you get me. And I'm going to see to it that you get the extra value that makes the difference. The next key is the key of the narrative story. It's a talent. It's something that too many people all too often miss out on, is the narrative story. I think it's sissified to tell stories. I think people are not interested. And yet, as a public speaker, I can tell you with total certainty that each and every time in any speech I ever make, when I start telling a story, I can literally see you as an audience lean forward. You want to hear the story. It's a tremendously powerful and effective weapon. One of my favorite stories is about the young business executive who was headed home one evening when he was involved in a near-fatal auto collision. His life was in the balance. He had lost a great deal of blood. He was in the hospital. He had a rare type blood, and the car went out all over for this blood, but none could be found. And finally, they checked the other members of the family, and his nine-year-old daughter, Kathy, little Kathy Abernathy, had the same type blood as her daddy. And so mother came to Kathy and said, Kathy, would you be willing to give part of your blood to your daddy so that he might live? And little Kathy bit her lips just for an instant and then smiled and said, why, well, of course. So they went to the hospital. The transfusion was made. The life was saved. And little Kathy Abernathy was laying there on the table against the white sheet, and she was almost as pale as it. And presently, her mother came in and said, Kathy, the doctor said, it's okay now. We can go home. And little Kathy looked up and said, Mother, you mean I'm not going to die? Are you talking about love? You see, it's obvious that she thought when she was giving a pint of blood that she was giving her life to go along with it. And this is a kind of story that's useful in, for instance, in the insurance business. But I don't care what you're selling. There are stories that you can tie to it. It's a third-party influence. It's a tremendous key. The next key is the key of enthusiasm, and this is another misunderstood key. So many people think enthusiasm is being loud, but there are a lot of people that it would be totally out of character to be loud. This is not their way. It simply is not. Let me define the word. It comes from the Greek word entheos, simply meaning God within. You see, enthusiasm is an outward expression of an inward feeling. Enthusiasm has got to be one of the greatest things that ever happened to anybody. Somebody once said, I believe it was Albert Hubbard, who said that nothing great was ever accomplished without enthusiasm. Now, once in a great while, we will have people that you will frighten off with too much enthusiasm. But this I promise, for every sale that you lose from being too enthusiastic, you're going to lose a hundred for not being enthusiastic enough. And so I'll go with the odds on this particular thing. It's a tremendous key. Now, when we start elaborating and enumerating the keys, the last one, in my judgment, has got to be the greatest of all. It's the key of sincerity. The key of sincerity. I'll lay you odds there is that a man or a woman in front of me today who has not on occasion had this kind of an experience. They bought something new. And somebody said, well, how come you to buy it, Bob? Well, I bought it because it's such a fantastic product. Man, it just does everything. And the other fellow says, well, what does it do? You say, man, it just does everything. It's a fantastic product. Yeah, but what does it do? Well, now, let me see. <laughs>
And all of a sudden you realize you don't really know anything that what you just bought will do. Why did you buy then? You didn't buy the product, you bought the salesman. Dr. Hugh Russell expresses this rather beautifully. When he says the customer doesn't buy from us so much because of the product as he does of the fact that the customer feels that we understand him. And now you see I'm blending empathy and sincerity in the same package because I think they go together. You see, when you start talking about sincerity, I think one of the most beautiful stories I've ever heard concerns the great English actor Charles Lawton. He used to go on Bible reading expeditions all around this country. And wherever he read, he was received with tremendous responses. When he would finish reading, the church would be totally silent for minutes at a time. It was quite an experience, they'd tell me. I wish I'd had the privilege of hearing him, but I never did. But the story is told that Charles Lawton was reading in a small Midwestern community once, and when he finished, he got the usual response. And then when he finished, shortly thereafter, a little old man, he must have been in his seven, that stood up and asked permission to read the Bible. And of course, it was granted. And as this little old man read, it was obvious to everyone there that his education was limited. His enunciation, his diction, his pronunciation certainly was not that of a Charles Lawton. But it was even more obvious to everyone there, including the great Charles Lawton himself, that if this had been a Bible reading contest, that Charles Lawton would have finished a very distant second. Somebody asked him, Mr. Lawton, how do you account for this phenomenon? The fact that this old man, virtually uneducated, bested you in reading the Bible. And Charles Lawton said, well, you know, I knew the script and I knew it well, but this old man knew the author. And when you get right down to it, we'll buy things from people who are sincere. We buy it because we just have the feeling that this person is doing right by us. It's a tremendous key. I want to close this this morning by telling you a little story about two of my favorite people. It's my little boy <laughs> and me. <laughs> <laughs> we were in Columbia, South Carolina, and old slug, really, that's what I called him instead of Mac. Old slug and I were doing some grocery shopping. And as we walked in the store and started down this particular aisle, I was pushing the basket. And over on my left in the other aisle was a display of rubber balls. Well, old Slug didn't say anything. He just walked over and picked up one of those rubber balls and came over and dropped it in my basket. Boom. Now, I want you to notice what he did. That was certainly a key of positive projection instantly, wasn't it? It also was physical action. It also was the assumptive attitude. Bang, he used three emotional keys on me instantly. I picked the ball up and I said, Slug, you've got a dozen balls at home now. You cannot have another one. I'm going to put it back. So he looked up at me and he said, Daddy, can I just hold the ball for a minute? <laughs> well, what would you have done? <laughs> I mean, now, what kind of a daddy would I be? There he is, three and a half years old, and all he wants to do is hold it. You see, that's a subordinate question, wasn't it? So I said, okay, son, you can hold it. But don't get any ideas. You're not going to buy it. you got so many balls around the house now, we can't walk. So we walked on down to the end of this first aisle in the grocery store and came back around, and we passed the display again. So I took the ball out of his hand. I said, okay, slug, that's long enough. You'll drop it and get it dirty, and then Daddy will have to buy it. And so I dropped it back in the display. Old Slug didn't say a thing. But when I turned around to go, he reached over and picked that ball up and ran back around me and in the basket. It went. That is persistence, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and he obviously hadn't been listening when I said no, had he? <laughs> so I, I was just as persistent as he was. I took it back out of the basket and I said, now, son, I said, you couldn't have it. And I started back for the display. And as I did, I looked down and there it stood. All 39 pounds of him. <laughs> he looked up at me and he said some words with a slight lisp at that time of his life. And he said, Daddy, he said, wish you buy me that ball. I'll give you a tiss. And he's enthusiastic about it too, I'll tell you. <laughs> and he's just as sincere as any child you've ever seen in your life. And in the process, you see, he was offering an inducement, wasn't he? And it was certainly an impending event. Now I want you to count the keys that this little boy used. He used 10 keys on me in less than 45 seconds. For your information, 
in the Ziegler household today, we have 13 rubber balls. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also going to go on record right here and correct a lie that I've been telling all over the United States. I think it's time we set it straight. For years, I've been touring the country and saying, I've seen where women have given birth to boys, and I've seen where they've given birth to girls. But never have I seen where one gave birth to a salesman. I've lied to you. Because you see, on February 1st, 1965, in Columbia, South Carolina, in the local paper, a small headline appeared. Mr. and Mrs. Zig Ziglar announced the birth of a salesman. <laughs> what I'm really saying here, of course, is the truth. That did appear. But what I'm really saying about all of this is that we can learn a lot of things from a lot of people, even our kids. On this bit of selling sometimes, I think it's particularly true. Because you see, you know what selling really is all about? I think it embraces two basic things. Number one is the transference of feeling. If I can make you feel about my product like I feel about my product, you're going to want to own my product. You see, that really is what it's all about. And the other thing is this. Over here, you've got a product. And over here, you've got a prospect. It's your job as a salesman to properly introduce the product to the prospect. If they're properly introduced, and if the product solves a problem for the prospect, the salesman with the proper introduction will get the business. Those are the keys. I hope you find them helpful. Thank you very much. <laughs>